have been here because uh, I enjoyed this book very much. I mean, I, I read part of the chapters when Mario was writing the chapters. And however, having them printed, it gives a different impression. I mean, it's, uh, and then I have also read the other chapters that I enjoyed also a lot. So, um, so I'm very glad to be here. I have been told that I have also to introduce the round table. And this is what I'm, I'm trying to do at the moment. Uh, the two authors of the book, Philip Deary and Mario Del Pero, you know Mario Professor Del Pero because he teaches here in our university, he teaches history of the United States, and he has worked also um, on intelligence, uh, and this is part of his work on intelligence in particular. Uh, professor Deary is Professor of Victoria University in Melbourne, where he teaches history of the United States. He's also an expert uh, in intelligence, uh, next to several other things, and in particular um, during the Cold War. Um, he's currently working on the uh, anti-communist campaign coordinated by the governments of Australia, the United States and Great Britain during the first years of the Cold War. Uh, our discussant is also a great expert on CIA, uh, Kate Mystery. He's research fellow at the University of Warwick, where he works on the history of the CIA, and he has written widely on the US uh, and Italy in the early Cold War. So I'm the only known expert here, <laughs> as known expert, uh, probably my comments will be one, those of a general reader, interesting book. The book is very, I wrote amusing, Professor Nathero said, well, why amusing? Well, because it is amusing. And you kept laughing. No, it's, 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 it's not, it's Someone not laughing. Like uh, and I want to give you an example of how amusing it can be. So, um, and tell me whether you have the impression of being within a novel or in a uh, this scholarly book. I'm sorry, this is Italian, sir, but it's something. No, 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 that's fine. But I should say I don't speak a word of Italian. I apologise in advance for that, but your English is impeccable. Rivelando ancora una volta la nostra ordinaria attitudine, l'EMI5 sospese la sorveglianza di Mexico durante il weekend con l'intento di riprendere la lunedì successivo, venerdì 25 maggio 1951. Burgess e McLean noleggiano una macchina, raggiunsero Mel Southampton e da lì salirono a bordo del traghetto notturno per Calais. La mattina, scusate, non sono un'attrice molto brava, la mattina presero il treno per Parigi e da qui per Berlino. All'ambasciata sovietica in Svizzera erano pronti per loro dei passaporti falsi. Con questi si imbarcarono sul volo per Praga, dove li attendevano alcuni funzionari dei servizi sovietici che li avrebbero accompagnati in Unione Sovietica la vita in Unione Sovietica. Non sarebbe stata facile per i due, e Burgess in particolare, che si rifiutò di imparare il russo, continuò a bere e visse in una modesta pensione, sognando il ritorno in Gran Bretagna. Ecco. Questo è uh, this is the, the tone of the book in general. Escape of the Greek. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, all these people drink a lot, so you always find people drinking the book. Um, they have they are English, though. So. Oh, well, yeah. Well, they're not only English, but they all drink. <laughs> 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 um, so it's very nice reading, but beyond being a very nice reading, it's also a very interesting perspective on the Cold War. Because it's based on the history of individuals. So you have these in stories of people, real people. Uh, and uh, that, however, had a very uh, relevant historical role. And the combination of the different levels, uh, this focus on the individuals, but at the same time, all the other levels of analysis, I would say, as a political scientist. So you have the individuals with their neuroses, their personality, their strengths, a lot of weaknesses, but at the same time, you, have, you are brought also within the framework of their family. So you have the family background, very interesting, a lot on the fathers, less on the mothers, I would say. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, then you have the, uh, the context within, they, within which they grew up. So you have the intellectuals in the Cambridge group. You have the common people of a Jewish family in the case of the Rosenberg. You have this snobbish right-wing son of a Mexican Catholic in the case of Angleton. So you have this 
you know, broad picture of a family life in which these people grow up. And in a certain sense, they give you a hint on, on the background, on their choice. Then you have the national context, which is one of the other variables explaining their choice, but also their life, and, and in the end, also what happened to them. Because uh, you, you, we discover it, um, a different national context, also in the way in which the spies are treated once they are discovered. In the case of the United States, ranging from different moments in different moments of the Cold War, uh, in the case of uh, Great Britain, and in the case of the USSR. Um, and also, this explains also the, the final results. In terms of the final results, uh, the USSR wrote to death all the spies that were discovered, if I understood correctly. Uh, in the case of the US, there was this uh, uh, striking case of the Jew, of the, the two no, the couples, uh, the Rosenberg, but others didn't have the same, uh, uh, the same uh, treatment. And in the case of the UK, um, it's quite surprising the way in which the, the um, Cambridge group is able, in a certain way, to escape um, a very serious treatment afterwards. Then you have the historical context, and we see differences throughout time in the heat of the Cold War, in other you know, lower moments of the Cold War, until the, the last one, 80s, when the uh, ideological momentum is less present and also the motivation and the reasons why these people get involved in spying tends to be more of an economic type, you know, earn money and for, in order to do other things. But in general, most of the spies described here do it for, most of them I would say, do it for ideological reasons. There is an important ideological moment reasons for that. Um, the, the impression, however, that one gets is that the uh, CIA was very much in the hands of individuals with all their limits. Mm -hmm. and, and this appears particularly in, in a very particular uh, way in the case of Angleton, because uh, the chapter of Angleton tells us that he was in charge of a, a specific counter, um, uh, counter intelligence assertion and for 30 years, that was more or less uh, um, his uh, Feldin, how do you say it in English? Feud. Feud. His domain. Um, yeah, his domain. Mm -hmm. So quite nearly unchallenged domain, uh, with a lot of implications uh, for the way in which uh, decisions were taken uh, on counterinsurgency in the CIA, and also in, you know, the debate that is, uh, and also the, uh, the trials, that is brought in the end. Um, so, uh, this impression of, of uh, such an important organization being in the hands of individuals with all their problems, a lot of them suffer of depression regularly, they drink regularly, uh, they, they incur in a series of abuses, they have a very um, uneven personal life, I would say, I mean, a strange person. So, the first question is, to what extent uh, the CIA was in fact in the hands of individuals and, and uh, also uh, to what extent this influenced the ability of an organization that should work um, in order to be efficient on the basis of something, you know, of procedures and rules that go beyond the single individuals. To what extent this was the case and to what extent in fact those individuals played a major role. The second question uh, has to do with relevance. Well, another thing that we learn from the book is that uh, there are uh, chapters in which one gets the impression that those spies had a very important role in the sense of delivering fundamental information that in fact then allowed those who received the information to either boycott uh, an action or, or prevent an action or whatever. That was the case, for instance, in the case of uh, Film B uh, um, and the planned uh, CIA operation in Albania. That was the case probably, uh, and here I got information only in terms of uh, masses of information that the Cambridge group passed on 
uh, to the USSR, but the, I wasn't able to understand the relevance of those information. And, and even the USSR was not able to understand whether this information was that relevant or not. And in certain moments they were you know, not that convinced that they were spies and not counter spies. Uh, so, the, the degree of relevance of those spies at the time is the second question. Um, the third question refers to a specific sentence that you write in the beginning, I think it was in the introduction, when you write that if the Cold War was in the end won by uh, the US and the Allies, probably the spy war was won by the USSR. Could you, could you specify what you mean by that? Because, uh, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't understand reading on it. Not being an expert whatsoever, not being knowledgeable why you wrote that. Because yeah. I was thinking, I'm not aware of that. <laughs> that was in the introduction, I think. Yeah. And then, um, sorry, the two questions and then it's over. Uh, the fourth question has to do with the role of those spies in uh, uh, the European countries. Um, the, the one, I think the chapter in which this becomes more evident is again the one uh, on Angleton, where he's uh, sent to Italy, and in particular during the first uh, elections after the war, uh, he is part of the, of the team, of the CIA team, trying to influence those elections. And, and the, the chapter, I think it was Margaret's chapter, is rather cautious in evaluating the real impact of the... Well, we have the expert. So you can ask. Okay. And then finally, uh, the book is, uh, as I told, terribly interesting and, and intriguing in bringing us in the logic of the Cold War. And so it brings us in the moment in which the human factor is very important, the ideological battle is important, the technological tools and disposal of intelligence are not that developed. To what extent can we think of current spies, contemporary spies, in similar terms in the internet age? And I'll finish here and then pass the word to you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, Thanks. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and in many ways it's fitting that we're sort of meeting now at this at the time, um, as, as we just heard in the passage that uh, Sonia read out, it was in May 1951 that Guy Burgess and Donald Clink, uh, two of the famous came to fly, uh, five flee the UK to head back to Soviet Union. Uh, now, we all know that Professor Burr is very well prepared, but I'm not sure how much uh, the release of this book is to coincide, is to mark the 60th year anniversary. Um, but I think it points to another important uh, theme that comes up here, which is of chance uh, and contingency. Um, in short, sort of small, unforeseen things uh, have had an effect on in, in pretty much all of the chances that we, that we see in this book. Uh, and in turn, this, this has an effect, uh, obviously, on the history uh, of the spy, the Cold War spies and the Cold War itself, um, taps into some of the broader political uh, and domestic debates that uh, these themes sort of feed on and fuel. Um, the history of the Cold War and the US experience of this Cold War would be very different, uh, for example, if Richard Nixon had never uh, become president. Um, so, in one of the, well, on the chapter in Alga Hiss, we, we, we find out um, the story is told as to how uh, Richard Nixon's political f um, career uh, is intertwined with, uh, with the Alga Hiss case and his outing as a communist spy. And how little things like the development of a film by the Eastman right. Kodak, um, uh, th th this film needed to be developed as part of the prosecution of the case against. Uh, I'll get hit the very first time it was developed. There was no sort of proof. Um, but then a, a technician at Kodak went and checked the film again, and in fact, it did uh, sort of implicate that. So, little things like that. There's a wonderful quote in here, which I think you quote by Richard Nixon, who says that my career would be over if, uh, if this film didn't come back and sort of prove I'll get his, um, his guilt. Well, we see this also with other very prominent figures, Joseph McCarthy, the, the entire era that, that is uh, sort of symbolised by his name, McCarthy is sort of anti-communist hysteria, as well as intertwined with, with, with many of these cases. 
Ronald Reagan as well, we find out, um, was heavily influenced by within Chambers' autobiography, Chambers, of course, being the character who um, played a leading role in the downfall of the market is. Um, one, of the, one of the great strengths of this, uh, which has already, I think, been touched upon, is the human face. Uh, two spies, their motivations, their desires, their weaknesses, fragilities, paranoias, and in some cases, their tragedy. You know, duplicity, secrecy, when, when we see it in films and TV, um, it seems quite glamorous, but the stories that we um, that, that read about in this book are, are anything but. Uh, and in this way, I think it better defines why people spy, why did some, uh, some individuals come across as traitors. Uh, and, we, and this ranges from personal to professional issues. Uh, in many cases, there are problems like uh, older chains, alcoholism, very status conscious, uh, quite a, a lavish spender. Um, he, he can't have enough money. He's, he's got to. He's got to fuel the. Uh, he's got to uh, sustain a very demanding wife. And that's what it takes. Uh, so the, the problems are both um, ideological, but also personal. But also linked to money. Uh, in the case of the Rosenbergs, we read about sort of their great loyalty and love for one another. Which is something you don't sort of hear about as much when you read about sort of the whole Rosenberg case. In the case of Guzenko and Petrov, there's a desire for a better life, but also a revulsion at the Soviet system under Stalin. So there are a combination of push and pull factors. Um, and in this way, I think the book does a very good job of refuting the, the old binary as to why spies spy. It was money, it was ideology. Well, it was money, and it was ideology, but there was also other things. They're not mutually exclusive, and there are a lot of overlaps. Uh, the motives aren't always clear cut, they're sort of mixed up. Especially when you're relying on memoirs, biographies of, of individuals involved for, for, for reconstructing these, these sort of narratives. Um, so, my first sort of question to the authors would be um, so to understand why people spy, do we need to take a uh, sort of case by case approach, as, for example, this book does, like individual uh, characters or so? Periods, or, or can they identify some sort of broader overarching themes and factors uh, as to why uh, people spy? I, I ask this uh, because it's particularly interesting um, in that there's the potential for a, a sort of a refreshing and a new approach that draws on the political and uh, what social and cultural issues well. um, we've, we've talked about the elitism and this obsession with class. We see older chains who who wants to join this, this sort of group. Uh, and James, Jesus Angleton is exposed to this as a young child when he travels to Italy as part of this cosmopolitan elite. And his young career growing up, uh, attending Harvard in many ways, epitomizes this. Uh, we see the case of the Cambridge Five, and uh, the British structure very much protects the, 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 this sort of class of person, the likes of Kim Philby. Um, but at the same time, someone like Al Gahis was brought down by the very un-elitist Whitaker Chambers, and especially Richard Nixon. Nixon was famous for his, his, um, his sort of anger towards that northeast establishment of the uh, a vendetta he bore, or, or an issue he carried with him throughout his life. And in many ways, we can see his downfall, his obsession, secrecy, uh, and whatnot, uh, targeted against this, sort of, uh, this elite of the northeast and Georgetown and Washington. Um, so one point would be to what extent uh, class and elitism uh, <coughs> plays in, 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 in the characters or the, these figures. Is there a correlation to elitism and spying? Also, um, another point which kind of we see in several uh, chapters, which is that of sexuality. Um, there are several figures in this talk, um, Chambers, members of the Cambridge Five, and there's a lot of suspicion about the sexuality, namely what they have to so these chapters sort of touch upon it, but I wonder if, if, if the authors can sort of expand on it uh, and sort of comment maybe how or if this may influence sort of the pursuit of these uh, spies, their consideration of them, their treatment, and their eventual sentencing, uh, particularly in the US where sort of fear of homophobia, uh, or homophobia rather, was, was, was intertwined with this sort of debate as to what was American. We could also perhaps see it with respect to race as well. Jewish American identity with the Rosenbergs, um, you know, doubts about their Americanness. Um, my second or third point, rather, would be uh, about this book is that 
Another strength of it is that it's very much in line with the Cold War historiographical debates, uh, in that it reveals an important link between domestic and international trends in the Cold War, uh, both in the US but also abroad. Um, in the first chapter on Vizenko, um, we, we, we hear about how Canadians, uh, the Canadian authorities are quite concerned about the Vizenko case. They, don't, they fear for the political ramifications if, if the story of a Soviet defector comes out. This is in contrast to uh, someone like the, uh, the head of the FBI, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who is actively sort of pursuing this and wants the story to come out and plays a, a role in uh, leaking information. Uh, the reason for that, domestic considerations, sort of the hunt for, for Soviet spies or communist sympathizers within America, but also his sort of bureaucratic position, his influence, his power. Uh, with the Rosenbergs, uh, the, the onset of the Korean War, uh, Soviet Union acquiring the atomic bomb and China suddenly turning communist, um, is crucial to their fate, their sentencing, uh, when, they, when, they, when they've given their, their death sentence. Petrov, um, in the chapter on uh, uh, related to Australia, um, in the attempt to prove Petrov's, uh, that Petrov was not a real spy, then the Australian opposition party effectively ends his political career in his attempt to, uh, to gain information. But also within the United States, there are some important uh, issues and some complications that the book draws out. Uh, particularly that the issue is not strictly between two political parties. It's not just Democrats against Republicans. Uh, so for on, on, the, on the chapter of Alka Hiss, we learned that um, on the one hand, you have someone like Richard Nixon, a very staunch Republican anti-communist, who is yeah, looking to, 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 um, to essentially bring down his. On the other hand, we have someone like John Foster Dulles, another stalwart of the Republican Party, who's very close to publicly supporting him. So this is another area in which the book does a very good job, I think, in, in sort of complicating these sort of simplistic divides. Um, my final point, and, and, and this is another, another great strength of this book, is that it talks to the key question of how much intelligence and spying actually happened in the building of Simon's point earlier. Um, did spies really um, sort of bring about the start of the Cold War? Um, and again, this taps into broader historiographical debates. Uh, you have famous historians like John Gaddis who are asking this question, did the intelligence matter in the 80s? Um, Richard Immerman recently repeated this, um, sort of doubting whether intelligence has made much difference to US foreign policy. Uh, Federico Romero's recent book on the Cold War as well is very dismissive of this. And in fact, even some of the characters we meet in here, Audrey James um, says that spying was a stupid game. Um, he, he just he feels that the CIA is justifying itself by exaggerating the, the communist threat and the Soviet threat. Uh, and Ames, I think, the, the Ames episode encapsulates this issue. As Simon said, this was a great loss for the CIA, it was a win for the KGB, yet at the same time the Soviet Union was collapsing at the same time. Um, so the Soviet Union, and I think the author's right in this, that they win the battle of the spies and mm -hmm. lose the Cold War, and the book does a good job of that. My question or query, rather, would be um, related to Ames. Um, the Soviet Union's collapsed, but Ames is still giving information to the Russians. And this is three years after 1991 when the Soviet Union has collapsed. Um, he's eventually caught in 1994. Um, so my, my, my point or query would be the spying existed before the Cold War. Um, it continues afterwards. Um, what does this Ames case tell us about um, sort of broader issues around sort of U.S. relations with countries, particularly Russia, post Cold War up to today? Is there a sort of a hangover that we can sort of identify from the Cold War? Um, issues of distrust, uh, spy competition. Are there lessons for others? Uh, for example, uh, China. Uh, how does this affect relations with the U.S.? That said, I think it's a wonderfully written book. It's very accessible, um, detailed, and deals with very big issues in a, in a very different manner. Uh, and I congratulate the authors on, on, on this accomplishment. Thank you. Can I just thank you for both of you for your wonderful, insightful comments? Thanks a lot. You might first. Well, look, I think I might take up the question that both of you have asked, and it's part of your last question. Although I'll let Mario deal with Aldrich James, um, but it's it's to do with how important was espionage? How relevant was it? Did it make a difference? Did it matter? 
Because when you stand back and look at the whole scheme of the Cold War and how it unfolded, and the big power relations and the East-West binary divide, where is espionage in all of this? So the, e the easy answer is that it's still an open question. It's very difficult to pin down and say, ah, that's where it made a difference, that's where it didn't, because it's in the mix of relations. It's an element in international trust, distrust, negotiation, understanding, misperception and exaggerated ideas about the other side. And in some ways it tended to espionage arguably, I'll get to my point in a minute, espionage arguably under, um, under, un, underpinned some of the more realistic assumptions because each side found out more about the other. And in that perverse sort of way, espionage diminished the tensions between the two powers because they knew more about each other. Now, on a more precise note of did it matter, did it make a difference, was it relevant, I think we can put nuclear espionage, we're talking about the bomb here, into a slightly different category and here evaluate it a little bit more sharply than what I was implying before where it's very difficult to put a pin in it and, and say, yep, yeah, I've got it, That's we can quantify it, right? Because that explosion of the Soviet atom bomb, somewhere over the Siberia, probably near a gulag, in the summer of 1949, did, in my view, make a difference. But before I indicate how it may have made a difference, let's go back to the acquisition of that bomb. And as Mario argued in his chapter on um, Klaus Fuchs, it's strongly arguable, and I always hide behind those terms, arguable, I'm saying this is the facts, but it's strongly arguable that the secrets that Klaus Fuchs, as you, I don't know how much you know, you know a British born, um, sorry, German born, um, British atomic physicist who worked at Los Alamos on the Manhattan Project, right? And the information that he gave to his, to the Soviet Moscow Centre via his handlers, um, accelerated, and this is the consensus, by between one to one and a half years, probably closer to, I don't know, you know what you'd think, about one and a half years. So in other words, the Soviets, whose scientists were very you know, clever buggers and, and highly developed and sophisticated, would have got the bomb, but it was accelerated by that sort of period. So what? Well, the so what is both good and bad, if you like. Um, it may have acted, and I have to say it may, because there's no concrete proof on this. It may have acted as a deterrent for the US using its otherwise monopoly, its atomic monopoly, in China. The, the fear of, of, of the anxiety generated by Mao's success, and now it's just a few weeks after the atomic bomb tests were taken from the Soviets, um, it may have acted as a deterrent there. The other, and I'll finish my point soon, the other sort of flip side is that it's again arguable, strongly arguable, that the atomic, that the Soviet's acquisition of the atomic bomb gave Stalin the, the confidence to give Kim Il-sung the the imprimatur, the green light, the go-ahead to invade the South and, the, and hence that long war of attrition, the, the Korean War, which by the way coincided with the period of the Rosenbergs arrest, trial, execution and so on and I might return to that later. But I'm trying to make out a case that in this particular area of nuclear 
espionage, it did make a difference, and it can be one of two ways, I think, that it made a difference. But those who committed the espionage, and we're looking at the, the common turn, uh, sorry, the Cambridge, so-called Cambridge common turn, the Philbys at all, and the Rosenbergs, and probably Elgin um, um, they were all hoping for a better world. They were giving secrets to the Soviet Union because they had the belief that the Soviet Union was the, was the new world, was the red dawn. And that didn't happen. So their espionage didn't really make a difference in that regard. The final point is, and why it's difficult to answer that question about how important was it, and I think Sonia touched on this, is how was the information received you know, through the what are called the Venona decrypts? And again, I don't know whether you're familiar with that. Some are nodding, and some mightn't be aware. Through the Venona decrypts, which was a, a cryptological breakthrough by the Americans, decoding Soviet top secret cables, so top secret that Truman himself didn't know about the operation. Um, through the Venona decrypts, we've got an idea of what sort of information was being transmitted to the Soviet Union. And you think, aha, well that's important, that must have made a difference. But we don't know, and, and, and until a whole lot of other military intelligence archives are opened in, in, the, in Moscow, we won't know um, how it was received, what was done with it. There's evidence, I think, in Mario's chapter that Philby's information was too good to be true. You know, you don't believe this. This is hot, man. You know, um, and so that's the other sort of dimension which makes it difficult to pin down how important was it, except in that area of nuclear espionage. Oh. Is that it? Yep, that's it. <laughs> Sorry, I took a bit longer than I meant to. No, that's all right. You're very short. Now, as thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thanks a lot to you, uh, uh, to uh, Sonia and Casey for, for the comments and the praise. Far too generous, I guess. Uh, as uh, Sonia described the book as amusing, and uh, so if you are depressed, if, you, if your team loses, if your partner leaves you, just buy a copy of the book, open it up, and you will get a good laugh and life. <laughs> Shine at you again. It's, a, it's an amusing book. Genre, <laughs> comedy. <laughs> exactly. Uh, on a serious uh, note, um, I will try to address uh, uh, some of the points uh, raised by, by, by Sonia and by Kate. Uh, the first one, uh, again, uh, following up on what uh, uh, Philip was saying. Um, importance, uh, relevance. Uh, Philip and I have been discussing <laughs> this uh, issue on and off for quite uh, uh, some time. There is no clear-cut answer. It's very difficult to uh, say how important was intelligence and how important was espionage. Uh, uh, in my view, it, it was simultaneously more and less important than we usually think. Uh, uh, the Cold War came to be identified with uh, the world of spies, of intelligence. So in terms of representation, uh, intelligence was indeed very important. Uh, spies became in the public imaginary sort of, you know, a representation of what the Cold War uh, was, of its intimate essence. Uh, so it was very important in studying the representations of espionage how espionage was taught, narrated, constructed, invented. It's a good way to look at the public representations of the Cold War and of the fears, somehow, that the Cold War created. First point. Uh, second point, which is more or less the old uh, John Gaddis's argument. Intelligence may, was important because it made the two sides more knowledgeable yeah. about each other. Mm -hmm. And when you know more about your enemy, uh, uh, you are less prone to take unwise choices and to take 
risks. Now, deterrence, uh, the basic mechanism on which the Cold War peace rested, deterrence was based on transparency, knowledge of each other, especially in the first stage up to the mid-70s, knowledge of the Soviet Union, of its nuclear potential, of its ultimate goals. And intelligence helped uh, uh, to uh, uh, make the Cold War uh, a world a bit more transparent. And therefore defuse some of the exaggerated yeah. fears. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And in that sense, it mattered. Finally, uh, intelligence, the word says it all, is about intelligence, making those who take decisions, making decision makers more intelligent, or if you will, less stupid than they usually are. And uh, uh, the point is that intelligence is uh, 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 effectively used by intelligent people. If you're not intelligent, you can get as much intelligence in terms of information you, you want, but your decision will be somehow influenced and shaped by your stupidity. And this goes back to the Philby case. Philby and even more uh, uh, Blunt and McLean were giving a lot of information to the Soviets from 1941 to 1945. And the Soviets, notoriously stupid at that point, because the, the, the Soviet intelligentsia had been decapitated yeah. uh, throughout the 1930s by, by, by Stalin. Uh, and the Soviets did not believe it, it was, as you say, too good uh, 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 to be true. true. So basically, they were too stupid to make good use of intelligence. And I can offer up several examples, even the CIA. I mean, the CIA and CIA experts were very skeptical on the intervention in Vietnam uh, uh, very, very early on, much earlier than the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, the Pentagon, or even the State Department. But no one was paying attention to the CIA at the time. The CIA had been institutionally weakened by failure of the Bay of Pigs and by all what followed. So a very effective intelligence agency in terms of the intelligence it was able to produce was incapable to influence the decision-making process because policymakers were not intelligent enough to make use of such intelligence. Uh, briefly on, on, on the human factor, uh, which uh, Sonia uh, highlighted, I, I must admit one of the reasons I first <coughs> proposed, uh, Philip, I first uh, uh, asked Philip to co-write this book, uh, is that I like biographies a lot. It's fun. I mean, reading biographies, good biographies, uh, uh, is fun. Amusing, <laughs> indeed. Uh, it's a literary uh, 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 category, uh, 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 genre, genre, which is not really uh, very popular in Italy, differently from the UK and the oh, US. There are yeah. not many biographies around. It's quite unusual, especially for professional scholars, to, uh, uh, to write uh, uh, biographies. And that's why I felt you know, it could be fun. And if I can just interrupt your flow, sorry, but going back to your points on what we were trying to do frequently was integrate the personal into the political. Yeah. And so it wasn't just biographical details for their own sake and leave it at that, but how that impinged upon political outlooks and political um, activities. So, so that both came quite comfortably to us having that biographical approach. And I've just finished a study at NYU on an American communist writer, very well known there, less so beyond that. And again, I've tried to do that same kind of thing. Well, how did his life shape his outlooks and therefore influence how the FBI, in this case, perceived him? So it is that integration of the political and the personal to throw bigger and broader questions on that society in which they operate. Sorry to interrupt you, I was just reinforcing that point in terms well, of our modus operandi. The personal can be political in many yeah. ways, and when you do these biographical sketches, you discover that uh, uh, very quickly. Furthermore, uh, both Philip and I are historians, are historians, and we have spent, I guess, a fair amount of time in the archives. And, 
And when you go into the archives, well, you have to be a little bit also based your personality and how personal decisions yes, yes, yes. influence even you know big choices, uh, major choices, uh, uh, personal decisions, personal you know sensibilities and so forth yeah. and so on. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of the most recent histories of the Cold War, whether you agree with them or not, they stress the personal factor. Uh, John Gaddis did in the, the, the last book he wrote, the Cold War, History of the Cold War, the 2005 book, uh, 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 Mel Lefler did uh, for the soul of mankind, which is basically about Soviet and US leaders, five different couples of Soviet and US, uh, and US leaders. And as much as I like to deal with structural factors, major trends, uh, and geopolitics or economics, you can never, never dismiss uh, the importance of the personal element because at the end, I mean, human beings take uh, decisions, make inventory mistakes, and move, contribute, contribute to move the historical uh, uh, process. Oh, Before you move on to your next point, what about Kadam's point about the sexuality? <laughs> so this is still within that framework of personality. Do you think I, the sexuality of the of, of Burgess, McLean and so on was a factor in the pursuit, no, in their attraction to the world of espionage? I can talk about Rosenberg and his. But, well, you but, know, knowing you a bit, I thought you wanted to do the issue of sexuality. Well, nevertheless, no. Uh, uh, what do you want me to do? You want to start me? I mean, I, I, as you like. I, mean, I have many points, so I can just stop and All right, well, flow this is like okay. if we <laughs> interact with each other. We, we know, we, I mean, we have been knowing each other for quite some time. I don't know if you are familiar with the Muppet shirt. <laughs> Muppets, but basically, we are like two old grumpies, the two old guys in the Muppet shirt. <laughs> and on uh, sexuality, uh, many, I mean, most of them um, had kind of turbulent, complicated yeah. uh, sexual. Uh, 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 or right. the Cambridge people. Yeah. Especially the Cambridge group. Now, for the Cambridge, in the case of the Cambridge group, you had a couple of very kind of uh, over the top uh, homo sex sexuals. Uh, uh, Can you say that word okay? You're okay with that? I, I am. <laughs> you know, it may be like slowly <laughs> and overcoming prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I can be able to show now. <laughs> Uh, and for people like Blunt, even more Burgess, uh, there was a connection between uh, uh, social and capitalist, if you will, uh, oppression and sex, sexual uh, repression. Uh, among uh, sexuality was forbidden uh, in England at the time, as well as in the US. So there was a connection and message of, you know, social emancipation represented by socialism was somehow translated even to the sexual uh, realm, especially in the case of Burgess. Burgess was very explicit on that. So yes, now as of today, uh, and from what, from what I know, there are no kind of serious, solid uh, uh, analysis of espionage and intelligence history based on gender categories. Now Michael Holtzman, in his book on Angleton, Holtzman is a literary critic, and he does like studies, and he tries some here and there to you know, use gender categories, too, but in a very kind of superficial and uh, I must say even banal uh, sort of way. So that's uh, a, a fertile ground for further research. I mean, the language of, of espionage was immensely uh, uh, gender biased, and I think there is a lot of potential for research on, on that. You want to mm -hmm. say something? Oh, a number of things are coming into my head. Uh, um, but uh, yeah. just another member of the, the so-called Cambridge Comintern was Anthony Blunt, or later yeah. Sir Anthony Blunt, um, and who, who was homosexual. Um, and there's a class dimension too, because in that, whether it was particularly Cambridge University, or it was simply the ruling class or the elites in Britain, 
it was paradoxically quite acceptable to be homosexual. And so the circles in which Burgess um, and Blunt moved in were often homosexual. And there was a, and then marrying that point with Mario's, Mario's point about um, um, the, the ideal of socialism being a guarantor of greater sexual liberation and so on, made them ripe candidates. So it was your question, I think. I think there is an element of attractiveness towards espionage because of that gender question. In the case of the two Americans that I wrote on, or the two groups of Americans rather, Algis and the Rosenbergs, homosexuality wasn't an issue. Um, as you would have seen if you've read that, the intensity of the passion, and I can use no other word, that flowed between um, Ethel and Julius when they're on death row for those nearly three years was almost palpable. You could feel it um, in their correspondence. And there's one momentous photograph um, of them in a, what we would call in Australia, a paddy wagon, a police wagon with wire. And they're trying to kiss each other between the wire. And any form of human intimacy was, was grasped. Um, Algis and his wife Priscilla were extremely close. There's one body of thought which argues that Algis was in fact protecting Priscilla, that she was in fact culpable of espionage. Um, after he came out from prison, their relationship, as often happens, it was strengthened when he was in prison, but when he came out, uh, after his release rather, um, their marriage disintegrated. Their son continued to, as he still does, this very moment, <laughs> still lives in the same home, the same apartment, I'm sorry, in Was just off Washington Square, uh, Square Village, uh, Park, Washington Square Park, um, l ended up living with Elger. Um, I don't know how much I should go down this path, but it has a, has a contemporary resonance. We can measure Bonnie. Yeah, well, that's what I was thinking. I don't know whether you'd be interested in this or not, but it's not in the book, you see. Um, and it goes back to the enormous difficulty I had in writing that chapter on algae hits. And it was part the conundrum, the tension, the conflict between the heart and the head. Um, the head said, yes, of course he's guilty. It was about, is he innocent or guilty? And this is still, still being debated in circles in New York now. Right? Um, and my head was saying, yes, he's guilty. There's a variety of evidence from Whittaker Chambers, whom you mentioned, Elizabeth Bentley, the Venona decrypts, which I mentioned before. More recently, references to him in what's called the Vasiliev notebooks. Alexander Vasiliev was a, a KGB bloke who who, who defected and he had lots of scribbles and notebooks and so on. The, the heart is every time I go to New York, which is every couple of years, I meet up with Tony, Elger's son. And so we have coffee across the you know, thing. And he is devout in his father's innocence and wages a small, or is, is in the vanguard of a small campaign to vindicate, even now, after Elger died, gee, 1993, 1994? Four. Four, the age of 92. So it's not that long ago. A campaign to vindicate him. And he set up um, a website, you know, elgerhist.com, which itself is very controversial because it had the NYU dot NYU, EDU, etc. And so there was a problem there. Just two weeks ago, there was an, a, an attempt, because there's a very wealthy benefactor who believes in Elger's innocence, and she is able to bankroll a lot of these initiatives. And one was for a postdoc fellowship to be called the Elger is postdoc fellowship. And the, um, and, and the NYU administration, no, 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 sort of thing. But just back to Tony for a minute. So I would meet him and I'd think, 
He, and he's a lovely man, a very gentle, soft, ingenuous, like looking in the eye and you believe him kind of thing. And he was utterly, utterly convinced of his father's innocence. Because how could my father, for 30 years, deceive me, lie to me? Which is what would be involved were Algenesis I. Um, and I heard, this is very off the record, um, but I know, and it wasn't Tony that told me this, that um, when Alger came out of jail, he was estranged from Tony. There was a stepson, Timothy Hobson, who came out of the homosexuality. I'll get back to my other point, though, I, I do these tangents. Who came out at a conference, what, one and a half years ago, on Alger Hiss at NYU, and it was immensely controversial because there were scholars who came up with evidence that he wasn't Ailes. Ailes was the Venona code name for his and so on. Very controversial. It was on you know, page three of the New York Times, that sort of degree of controversy and so on. Um, but Tony said to a bloke, a bloke, a, a, a friend who told me that he was very estranged, father and son were very estranged, until Tony took up the cudgels, you know, took up the campaign on Alger's behalf, and they became very close and remained so until Alger's death. So talk about, what is it, the old biblical adage, the sins of the father visited upon the son and so on. So this is a case of the, his case resonating into the present. The same with the Rosenbergs, but I won't deal with that now. But I just wanted to um, extend extend that, that point about, um, where was it? Oh, initially about sexuality and so on. Canon before said, well, possibly with the Rosenbergs it was race. And there are still many, many people in New York today, and I've spoken to them, they said it, that underlying the conviction of the Rosenbergs was anti-Semitism. So you mentioned race. Um, um, there wasn't a Jew on the jury, but the judge, Irving Kaufman, was Jewish. How do you explain that away? Well, because he was trying, uh, this is not necessarily my view, this is an argument, but it's an argument held by many, including scholars, that Kaufman, was trying to demonstrate, this is Cold War America, was trying to demonstrate that there is such a phenomenon as a patriotic Jew, as an all-American Jew, and that his death sentence, which J. Edgar Hoover didn't support, he certainly didn't support it on Ethel, who was actually innocent. Um, um, he went much further than the FBI or the Justice Department or generally wished to go. Because as you may or may not know, they used, wanted to use Ethel, and I used the word in that chapter as a lever against Elger for him to then reveal the names of other agents and so on. So um, I guess my point is that Kaufman, um, you know, almost, I won't say lost it, but, but you know, he's almost metaphorically frothing at the mouth when he said, you are responsible for the deaths of 50,000 American lives. You know, astonishing stuff because of the, because of the Korean War, you know, of, the, of the lives that have lost in the Korean War. And if I can finish off while I'm on a roll, <laughs> um, and then I'll shut up and hand it back to Maria, <laughs> and you must have a chance to answer <laughs> questions too. You know. um, there is a... There's now, when I was talking about these cases resonating into the present, there is a newly formed national committee to reopen the Rosenberg case. You know, I know that might sound strange, you know, given they were executed in, in 1953, you know, a long time ago. Um, one of the prime movers behind it is the son, Michael Mirapol. Mirapol, because it was Abe Mirapol, I forgot his wife's name, just got a blank, who fostered them after the parents were electrocuted. Um, but he, unlike Tony, and I got to know him really well in New York just this time, 
confronts the evidence. Right? So he's and, and accepts that yeah, they were they were they were guilty of espionage, but not guilty as sentenced. Going back to Kaufman, remember he was saying you are you've got blood on your hands, kind of thing. You know about the Korean War that hinges on. Um, the Korean War started, and you know that point I was saying before, that the Korean War may have started because the Soviets had the bomb, right? And they were able, to, with confidence, to say to the, either the Chinese who had helped in the invasion or the North Koreans, you go for it. So what did you, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, do? You gave the secret of the atom bomb to the enemy, thereby causing these untold deaths. Now, just to finish off, the National Committee to reopen the Rosenberg case, of which Mike, Michael Mirabal is a key mover, and there's others, you know, don't, you don't want name drop or anything like that, say that there's a disjuncture, a discrepancy between what Kaufman said when sentencing them and what most people believed at the time and continue to believe and what they're actually charged with. They were charged with conspiracy, which means an intent, to commit espionage, nothing about the atomic bomb. Now, this committee and others, and I've now shifted my view. If I, I wrote this chapter probably a year ago, if I were to write it now, it would be slightly different on the Rosenbergs. Um, but That's a, it, off it, it, <laughs> a book came out in December last year, and the book launch or the book talk was in January this year, which I went to, and the authors were there and so on, called Final Verdict. And what it seems to argue, I'll just be really quick, <laughs> is that yes, they are guilty of espionage, but of military secrets, technological secrets including, for example, the device used by the Soviets to shoot down the U-2 plane flown by Gary Powers, right, that sort of stuff. But the secret of the bomb, which was Kaufman's term, and most people believed it, was not given by the Rosenbergs. It was a rudimentary diagram by David Greenglass. And then you have to look at these dates that they met the last time David Green was, who's Ethel's brother, and he helped put her in the electric chair, and that's that whole other dimension of love and betrayal and deceit and so on, which we tried to run through and which was in the title. Um, he gave that, the last time they met was January 45, he met his Soviet handler in September 45, and I didn't know any of this, has come out as some of the facility of documents, and so that's when he gave it. So their role was much greater in terms of atomic espionage than the Rosenbergs, or, or Julius in particular. So that whole thing has been, has been revisited by this committee. So I'll stop on that point because I've, I've gone off into various tangents and so on. Um, two minutes and then we we'll just open the floor up on a few questions. Of uh, Sonia and you know, Kate. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if the Soviet Union won the war of intelligence, and I think we should make a difference between espionage and intelligence. Uh, through spies, you gain information used in the process of providing intelligence or elaborating intelligence. So it was uh, comparatively easier for the Soviets to spy in the US than vice versa. So the Union was a closed society. The US uh, was relatively free and open despite this national security apparatus uh, uh, created after 1947. And, and the Soviets often won the war of spies, uh, so to speak. But when it came to intelligence, the CIA intelligence analysts, scholars, uh, pretty much like us, people spending their days in like, front of a computer book, not, you know, spying, just study the enemy and, and trying to understand the enemy a bit uh, uh, better, 
uh, uh, in terms of intelligence, this quality of, this, uh, of the intelligence estimates of the CIA was often, not always, but often very high. If you look at the entire controversy of the 1970s of the Soviet nuclear potential, the CIA was savagely attacked from the right, the conservatives, for being too liberal, too soft uh, uh, on the Soviet Union, for underestimating the Soviet nuclear potential. Retrospectively, uh, CIA scholars and analysts were quite correct in their assessments of the enemy, and that, that was often, not always, uh, the case. Finally, last point mentioned by 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 uh, Kevin on on the can we create more or less in Western wars a taxonomy of spies and the motivations? I don't think we can. I think we can, you know, just follow a case-by-case -case approach. There is no way to invent a model of why people <laughs> spy. And a case-by-case -case approach means, and I go back to what Sonia was saying, uh, a case-by-case -case approach means considering time, period in which it happened, the nation, the place, the cultural background, and so forth and so on. If you look at this, now eight plus one, Biographical sketches, I'm saying A plus one because we have the Rosenbergs. Uh, 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 there is such a variety of motivations that you can't find in any possible way uh, a model. I stop here because I just hope you're not too bored. And, uh, and, and, and uh, you have, you can you know, ask questions if you want to. Uh, if you don't, Philip and I can go on. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want that. <laughs> so, so it's in your interest. <laughs> I have a question. Gary. Yeah. <laughs> um, just, I want to ask you a very small question um, regarding your inspiration. And um, at the moment when you were working in this book, uh, I want to ask you. What do you think should be the impact to the reader about this book? Should it be considered as a novel in order, let's say, to have fun or as a lecture? Or is the novel a tool, a very important tool to get into uh, historical elements that you want to show? I mean, I know for better my professor, Michael Perro, and he's a very great uh, scholar, but I want to I wanna ask you if the focus that you have when you were work when you were working together your main inspiration was it to show your historical knowledge or to create a novel what is what about your approach about this because we were hearing a lot of uh, even sexual stuff you know but yeah, yeah. well a very basic response to that very good question is we did want it to be readable um, <coughs> We didn't want it to be so scholarly, and sorry, we're both scholars and we publish in journals where it's all of that normal scholarly apparatus. But the sometimes fantastic if you've got insomnia, you know, we didn't want we didn't want this book to put people to sleep. That's why sex runs through it, <laughs> um, and and humour. No. So, seriously, no, we did want it to be very readable and engaging for an interested but general audience. Would that, would that, be, would that be right? Not necessarily scholars, other scholars. Or students, that's what we have. Yeah, well, no, including it's students, students yeah, but not for... Yeah, but not only students. Yeah, not only students. Not that, sorry, mm -hmm. yes, that's right, yes. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't written to push... We, th we think we did it advert inadvertently, but not to push new frontiers of understanding about intelligent studies where it's in that more rarefied, high scholarly level. Um, we wanted to make it readable. We wanted to sort of focus, going back to Sonia's earlier point, of have the, um, the personal, the national, the historical. So at the end of it, you did get a feel, particularly for the cold, well, for the 40s and the 50s, possibly Aldrich James, obviously, is more recent than that. But for the 40s and 50s, well, what was it like? What, 
what made people tick, what were the reactions to them, um, and that stuff I was going on about before the Rosenbergs. There was hysteria. You know, hysteria was fueled by the external events of the Cold War, like America losing atomic monopoly, like America losing China, like the Berlin airlift, like the Italian elections of 48, you know, um, um, like the pra coup in Czechoslovakia, <coughs> in Prague, in 48. All of these things fueled that hysteria. So we want the readers to have a, have a familiarity with that and then locate these individuals in, in that setting and that it makes it readable. What do you think, Mario? Well, no, I, I, I agree with what you say. Basically, historians or scholars more generally, I mean, we write scholarly articles and books with a very specific and a mean? jargon oh, which, okay, yeah. which are read basically right, exclusively uh, by colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I was just revising the manuscript of an article I submitted to a journal and I noticed that the footnotes were longer than the text <laughs> itself. Are you looking at me? Ah, uh, yeah, it is, yes. <laughs> and, and that happens. Now, you know, there's a kind of, you use a sort of uh, uh, quote unquote scientific language and used by a specific. Uh, uh, epistemological community. And that's one part of your work, of your job. Then you write more general books which have to be used, are meant to be used by students, you know, textbooks mm -hmm. used in college, less uh, specific, but still kind of, you know, constructed in a certain way, which is the book you are reading, <laughs> one of the books you are reading <laughs> right now. Uh, and then sometimes we comment also in public affairs, and we write, you know, short articles or newspapers and magazines. Uh, I just, you know, wanted, I always wanted to, and that's possibly the first real attempt at this, to write also for a more general uh, uh, audience, but not for the audience itself. I don't care so much about the audience, <laughs> but because I thought that as a historian, as a scholar, it could be very helpful for me. I mean, it could be a, a learning, a formative uh, experience to try you know, to confront a different sort of public from the one I uh, 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 engage when I write my scientific articles, my journal textbooks, or my short uh, editorials. And that was the goal. Um, I also, in all frankness, I mean, I wanted to have fun and just, you know, try and we did. play with language and, you know, in a different way. Uh, 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 and uh, and that, that was the goal. So this one, I guess, is the only book I wrote that was read by my wife, so somehow I succeeded <laughs> in reaching a broadish uh, and you didn't even dedicate the book to her. And not kidding, I mean, the big book I wrote uh, on US foreign policy, the one you know quite well, my wife stopped at page three. <laughs> so, uh, so that was the goal. So you write a book that my wife wrote. So Veronica is the litmus test of. I really don't read it. <laughs> you can be sure. <laughs> well, talking of, about wives, my wife, who teaches um, politics at a, at a different university, set a chapter from this book last year and didn't acknowledge who, who wrote it. It's actually one of mine, not Mario. So, <laughs> and, um, and was a bit nervous in case the students. So, the second year the students, second year, um, what are you about? Fourth year? Fourth year, first year. Fourth year, yeah. No. Um, and, um, and, and so she was using them as guinea pigs, really. And it, and it was the one on the Rosenberg, so... Um, yeah. And anyway, it, 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 it seemed to work. So she was, she was being loyal to me, but, but they didn't say who it was that wrote it, I don't think so. So it's quite funny. Any other questions? Yeah. Two questions, actually. Um, when asking you about any kind of differences on espionage before and after the Cold War. 
Uh, there's a quite famous case that came into public attention uh, in 2007, maybe. The one of uh, the Wilson School. Uh, one was a former ambassador in Niger, and the wife was a uh, CIA operative. Exactly. Uh, the Wilson yeah. Reclaim. Yeah, they got uh, actually two novels on different views uh, of that uh, of those happenings. And as I, I to be honest, I read only part of your book still because I got to know it, it existed only recently. And it seems that there are no huge differences. I mean, maybe this uh, personal life and personal way to conduce the business in the work is just something that is concerning mainly. Espionage itself, uh, namely, you will not have a pre-regular life, and all the way you are going to conduce your work strictly depends on your personal insights, maybe, and how your office is taking uh, those into account. Uh, second, and more, yeah, most important question actually is uh, Professor De Perus said that uh, by espionage, the two superpowers uh, by uh, having reciprocal knowledge. Uh, were more cautious uh, and they didn't take any uh, any answer to steps. But maybe by knowing that uh, espionage networks existed, didn't this make a sort of uh, like, didn't this enhance the art race? Because they know they knew that there was something happening and someone probably knowing part of their secrets, so they had to create something more that they that that could not be discovered by their enemy. So wasn't this a sort of double-sided game? On one part, it was going to, it was a sort of also, I would say, confidence-building measure. On the other side, they had to work more to create something that cannot be part of this process, actually. Oh, shall I go first? OK. Oh, well, I'll start with the second question. Uh, the point that true intelligence and espionage the two powers uh, uh, were able to know each other uh, uh, better and, and being less uh, prone to go for the worst case scenario it has been made by several scholars and the most important is John Gaddis. Now, who's a personal friend of ours? Yeah, 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 we got a lot of that, <laughs> that work. Uh, indeed. Uh, uh, <laughs> I believe, I mean, by now, as a general rule, whenever US, the US intelligence, whenever the CIA was able to elaborate estimates of the Soviet uh, military capabilities, those assessments always downplayed the worst case scenarios. Uh, uh, which instead dominated public discussion on the CIA, on the USSR, its potential, its intentions, and so forth and so on. So at the end, uh, from what we know, uh, the CIA estimates of the Soviet Union, they have been published, some of them are available online, the, nuclear, at the, side, the website of the Nuclear uh, uh, Security Archive, of the Nuclear National Security Archive, and the CIA itself. If you go to the website of the CIA, you can find some of these assessments. From what we know, the CIA estimates of the Soviet Union downplayed the military potential of the Soviet Union. So they, they acted in a different way from the one you suggested by saying that the risk was by knowing more about the enemy, you were willing to somehow, you know, exacerbate the arms race and rearm and so forth and, and so forth and so on. Then, of course, several factors uh, contribute to, uh, to the arms race and possibly intelligence did in some specific juncture. In the early 1980s, the CIA, in order to regain its institutional power, <coughs> was willing instead to exaggerate the Soviet potential, because it was the only way to somehow be accepted by, by, by the Reagan administration. So there is also an institutional sort of, you know, gain, institutional sort of uh, 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 dialogue uh, going on. The CIA must not just be precise in its intelligence in order to be influential. 
that intelligence must be conveyed to the decision makers, and the decision makers must be must consider the CIA credible as an institution, politically reliable, in order to listen to it. Now, the CIA was very influential, <coughs> institutionally very powerful in the 1950s. It was very weak in the 1970s. In the 1950s, uh, the intelligence assessments, uh, on average, of the CIA were uh, 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 worse than they were in the 70s. But in the 70s, the CIA had limited access uh, uh, to, uh, to the decision uh, 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 to decision makers. It was able to influence only relatively the decision making uh, process. Uh, pre and post Cold War intelligence, which was also a point uh, of his, uh, in the Questions uh, 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 posed, posed by, by Sonia and, and Kevin are uh, that's very complicated. I think I don't know. We know very little on post Cold War intelligence. As I mean, historians need documents and work works uh, researches based on documents, so we don't have them. Um, we had this bizarre case recently. Russian spies uh, living in the US and, uh, and basically doing anything but spying. We're well, enjoying life in the US uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, uh, uh, on the Russian uh, intelligence agency. Uh, a big network. It was a big network, but they were spending most of their lives you know, just hanging around, sending kids to school, living in DC suburbs, and doing nothing. Maybe they were research funds. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> one could have applied for that LG is <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but, but when they were finally discovered, the CIA and uh, 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 the Obama administration claimed a major victory. Yes. You know, we discovered that we were able to penetrate and eventually uh, uncover this uh, uh, spy ring. Quite strikingly, Putin play politically uh, uh, as well, say, well, this Russia was able to do what the old Soviet Union was able to do. You had, this, you had you know, a, a network of agents mm -hmm. in the US for a very Just long right. time. Mm -hmm. Now, they were doing basically nothing except to enjoy, enjoy life. They, they came back they as... They were a, ready to pound. <laughs> they came back as heroes, literally heroes, uh, uh, in, in, in Russia. And it gives you an idea of this political dimension yes. in intelligence, which is still very much uh, alive. I don't know if you want to mm. comment on this. Well, obviously, just a contemporary example of, of intelligence is the, um, is the discovery of Bin Laden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in, and, and then the role of the Pakistani intelligence services in possibly protecting Bin Laden. Anyway, which what do you say? <laughs> um, the <laughs> that's why historians don't need contemporary analysis. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've actually got a question to Mario. I know this is rather strange, but when you're talking about the strength of the CIA and the, and the potency of its analyses in the 1950s, I'm wondering where the CIA, and this might be relevant to the stuff that you're studying, the relevance of the CIA assessments to Kennedy's claim, and we know it's a false claim, of the missile gap. And obviously that's not the intelligence that Nixon, when he was running in 1960, was using, but Kennedy chose to bastardise that CIA intelligence. So what were the power plays there? And what obviously the CIA had an accurate assessment that of the of the Soviet threat, of the Soviet capabilities, and they were giving that to Kennedy who chose to ignore it for political purposes. Would that be a fair you know missile gap controversy case, do you have an idea of what it is? In the second half of the 1950s, first in the public and political discussion within the US, the idea that there was a missile gap to the advantage of the Soviets was developing. And as a consequence of this missile gap, the US was becoming more and more vulnerable. And it was a way to attack the, uh, uh, the Eisenhower administration and accuse it of not doing enough to protect the US. 
And several Democrats, including Senator Kennedy, played this call. Mm -hmm. And a and, uh, uh, committee, the Geithel Committee, was created to investigate this claim and provide a report. And the Geithel Committee somehow uh, 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 confirmed the idea that uh, uh, lacking major uh, US, uh, major US investments uh, uh, in, in the arms race, uh, the possibility of a nuclear gap was real. Now, it was used politically to attack the Eisenhower administration. Eisenhower knew very well that was not the case. Up to the early 1960s, the US had a first, basically still a first strike capability, basically by attacking the Soviets, they could have you know, uh, eliminate any retaliatory uh, uh, capability, Soviet retaliatory capability. Now, the CIA at the time was run by Alan Dowless, who was the brother of John Foster Dowless, the Secretary of State, and he happened to be an Eisenhower Knight loyalist, he was very loyal to Eisenhower. So, uh, uh, if possible, uh, the CIA never confirmed a gap and certainly provided accurate intelligence mm -hmm. to Kennedy. Kennedy met twice with Eisenhower during the electoral campaign and he was briefed by Eisenhower who basically, from what we know, informed Kennedy that there was no missile gap, provided evidence for this, including the U-2 mm -hmm. uh, 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 yeah. information collected through the U-2 flights. Kennedy, quite unscrupulous, unscrupulously, decided to play the card. Uh, 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 nevertheless, even because you know Democrats are always considered to be weaker when it comes to national security and defense matters, and uh, uh, many scholars. I mean, the last book is by this scholar based at the Cato Institute, Institute uh, Pribble. Uh, many scholars downplay the importance of the missile <coughs> gap controversy in the electoral campaign and on the electoral outcome. So that is the side of the story. Mm -hmm. It was not so important. But nevertheless, uh, Kennedy had clear intelligence, yeah, yeah, yeah. knew there was no missile gap, and decided not to use this information. If, if I could just add one point to that, which is uh, Kennedy's opponent. 60, 1960 election race was of course Richard Nixon, and Nixon carried this grant with him throughout his life, particularly in the 70s, that the CIA, part of this Northeast establishment, uh, sort of conspired against him from winning the election, and uh, Alan Dulles and all of these um, sort of Princeton guys were, 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 were in bed with, uh, with Kennedy and his team and wanted Nixon to lose, and this is something that he keeps uh, sort of I mean, he's a president as well, he tries to keep the CIA. Well, in the early 1960s, 90%, up to between 80 and 90% of the, uh, of, the, of the CIA first level uh, uh, officials had been trained at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. That was it. So it was a very you know, elitist group of people. Uh, uh, tied together by bonds formed uh, in college in these kind of very elitist, very exclusive uh, universities. It changed a lot in the 1970s and this sort of, you know, uh, uh, future of the trade of the CIA completely disappeared afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Just a very quick and focused response to your question. I think if we make a distinction between the importance of espionage on the international and in international politics vis-a-vis -vis the importance of espionage in domestic politics. We might come up with different answers. I'd still stick to what we were talking about before, that it can in fact by transparency and knowledge diminish tensions through greater understanding, although it can be misused as Mario just described in 1960. But when we look at at least American domestic politics, the, um, the issue of espionage created, you're right there? Oh, that's John Lewis Gattis. <laughs> um, created tre tre tremendous um, fractures, uh, no, that's not even the right word, but um, 
paranoia in America, not in British, but in American society. So that the Hiss trials um, and the Rosenberg arrests were able to give subs apparent substance to Joe McCarthy saying, I have here in my hand, you know, a list of, you know the rest, I'm sure, that they were active spies, which was book rubbish, active spies within the State Department. So it raised that whole issue, which was the politics of disloyalty from 1950 through to 54, the, of the spies in government issue. And if someone as respectable as Alger Hiss, you know, going back to your point earlier about Nixon, Harvard educated, um, the president of the prestigious um, Carnegie Foundation, helped found, one of the founders of the United Nations, as I said in this book, he came back with a covenant on the plane for Truman to sign. That's how important he was. He sat be behind Roosevelt, um, no, 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 oh, sorry. No, it was it, it earlier, Roosevelt, um, Stalin, Churchill at Yalta. If someone like that, who's so high up, can be accused of the you know, of treason, the incarnation of, of this crime, well, it can be anywhere. There can be spies anywhere. And that created, this is on the domestic level now, an enormous amount of paranoia and hysteria. Just quickly, it didn't in Great Britain, despite Klaus Fuchs probably being one of the most important espionage agents in terms of that um, um, information about the bomb that I said before. He, was, he wasn't executed, was sentenced to 14 years jail and was released before that. So, yeah. so, so there's, there's a contrast on that level. So that was just a, another dimension by looking at, it, at, at how it played out domestically from how we responded at the level of international politics. Uh, sorry, if I, if I can join in on this. Uh, can we believe so the CIA um, and FBI conflicts through time also as a result of the fact that the, in the United States the domestic impact uh, was more relevant, more visible? So there was, of course, a fight for competencies in terms of counter espionage. Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 would, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. But, um, and the, and the, um, apparatus that was developed um, to combat real or alleged espionage at the domestic level, although it had international implications, was terribly important, was, was, was probably as, at least as important as knowledge of the Soviet's capabilities and the resources that were um, devoted to security services, you know, MI5 in Australia, it's called the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation or ASIO, or FBI, with which you'd be familiar, just skyrocketed because of that real or actual, real or apparent threat of domestic um, intelligence. So the counter espionage effort at the domestic level was, was significant. Yeah. Yeah, originally the FBI was in charge of intelligence in the entire Western Hemisphere and it lost its competence in 1947 when the CIA was established. The FBI was limited to domestic intelligence and counterintelligence. Yeah, but that, that, that became part of the CIA domain and, and, uh, and so there was, uh, uh, there was a conflict uh, on this. Plus, it's very difficult to distinguish between domestic and foreign uh, yeah, counterintelligence. Yeah. It, of course, the CIA had its own counterintelligence unit, unit which was led by, 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 by Angleton, and the clashes became frequent and yeah. common. And there was naval counterintelligence too, yeah. Yeah, in the Navy. I have just one uh, little question. I, I agree with Professor Bell and 
He said that uh, the missile gap was a sort of a WikiLeaks affairs because the Gator report was supposed to be secret and then was released to the press that exaggerated the indication of the Gator report. So it was a political issue used by, uh, by Kennedy in, in order to gain support with this uh, sort of paranoia. But um, I also agree with Professor Geary when he says that uh, atomic espionage was extremely important uh, for the Soviets in order to build their first, their first uh, atomic device, their first atomic weapon. But don't you think that this kind of importance progressively uh, lost uh, its power, uh, especially uh, in in the change between atomic and nuclear weapons, because if you know the distance, the years between the, uh, the, the establishment of our atomic arsenal in the United States and the first atomic weapon in uh, Russia was four years, but the, uh, the distance between the first uh, uh, atomic H bomb uh, between the U.S. and the USSR was only one year. So this. Mm, 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 this kind of, uh, of distance is also uh, caused by uh, um, the, uh, the improvement of uh, scientific relations, the transnational scientific exchange that helped and contributed in the uh, building of a, a network, of a transnational network that was not controlled by the states. And this helped also the, um, the relaxation of the international tensions since the signature of the limit has been treated in 1963. So don't you think that this importance progressively, progressively you know, lost its power? You've made several excellent points. <laughs> um, certainly that distinction between atomic and nuclear espionage was, was distinct and, and, the, and the level of um, um, intelligence activities in the area of nuclear espionage diminished. So you're completely right, I, I agree with you. I'm not sure about the level of international cooperation between scientists of the two blocks. There were several attempts by scientists, particularly in the post-war period, or especially in the post-war period, to, in, with their belief in internationalism, to try and achieve that cooperation. And as the you know, as the phrase goes, as the Cold War became chillier, those attempts were stymied or, or undercut. Um, in as much as scientists in the 1980s, if we're talking about you know, up to 91, um, achieved that level of trust and mutual understanding and sharing of knowledge, um, I'm probably a little bit less optimistic, or not optimistic, but a little bit less, um, um, what's the word, sanguine than you are. Um, what do you think? Positive. Less positive. Yeah, positive, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, so that's the best way I can answer your question, but a very good question. Yeah, yeah so you know, the inter international scientific community community made some attempts to... Uh, it's sure, certainly it did, like yes. Like polling petition or the yes. Pagwash conferences, for uh, example. That's right, and that would have contributed to the undermining of international tension, whether it contributed to the genuine sharing of, 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 of secrets. Of secrets yeah. yeah, that's where I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. It's almost eight, chair. Sure. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I have a question and I'm waiting for the others to finish with the questions because I'm, I'm eager to ask something. And uh, maybe, I don't remember what, but in the final chapter you define uh, the 1985, the year of the spy. Yeah. I'm, but um, when you deal about when you deal about older cases, older chains, yes. I found weird uh, that uh, the, mm, the golden age of co-protection uh, um, comprehend um, in the in the fifties comprehend uh, more than one year, and in the eighties, in the nineteen eighties, uh, is um, the year of the study is only one. Uh, don't you find it weird uh, and uh, because we have talked about the narrative and the historiography by the CIA. Because uh, if I if I think about eight years and and the rule uh, of uh, C 
CIA, I think about um, uh, William Casey, I think about a movie like Charlie Wilson War, the more of a kind of stuff. And the rule of, uh, of CIA uh, comprehended more than one year. So don't you find weird that, uh, that uh, in the 1985, in the 1980s, uh, only one year is uh, considered uh, uh, like the year of the spy, and uh, in the 50s uh, are considered uh, as um, the golden age of the cover protection. Yeah. My question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was called the year of the spy because somehow the spies were discovered in the in the U.S. and uh, and uh, it was very. I mean, in terms of public relations, in terms of uh, media coverage, it was a sort of you know a lot of attention to. to Spies all of a sudden, and the slogan "The Year of the Spy" came out. Now, spying and promoting covert operations are two different matters. Then sometimes spies are involved in covert, sometimes often spies or agents are involved in covert operations. But, but I, I will make a distinction uh, uh, between uh, uh, between the two. What is kind of striking is that the year of the spy, uh, the year when well, the period. Cold War of Spies erupted, coincided with uh, the beginning of the second uh, uh, detente between the Soviet Union and the US, the final one. So you had Gorbachev on the one side and you had KGB on the other, launching major initiatives to penetrate the enemy. And that's kind of a striking coincidence, I think. Uh, I don't know what, 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 what your opinion is on that. This kind of bizarre, you know. But on the one side is a, uh, an opening of uh, diplomatic dialogue as there has yeah. never been before, yeah. and some striking agreements are signed: the INF Treaty, uh, the Reykjavik and Geneva uh, conference uh, summits. And on the other side, you have the KGB just you know pushing, a, a, a relaunching a sort of attack uh, against the enemy. But that gives you a lot also of how bureaucracies. Uh, develop their own momentum yes, 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 quite yes, independently yes. of police, exactly. political or diplomatic that's, that's dynamics. What I would have said. Yeah, 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 that's right. If I could just add to that, I mean, there's also the issue of Reagan's very complicated period of power. I mean, there's quite a difference between his first term and second term. The first term is when William Casey is still around, he's in charge of the CIA, he dies in the middle of the 1980s. So a lot of these kind of operations that are launched are still going to be. Coming out of the pipeline at the end, like the mid 1980s. Wait. Wait. Sorry, keep going. Uh, no. Just his domestic situation. <laughs> <laughs> no, the love's about it. Do we have more questions? Well, I have, I have one, if I can. I mean, no, I don't think it would take long, but. Um, oh, uh, of, the, of the various uh, of the various cases brought here, there is the one woman here, um, and uh, the Ethel case. I mean, you in, in parts of the of the chapter on the Rosenberg, you you bring evidence of her being uh, guilty hmm? or being susceptible to be guilty. Some Venona's uh, reports. Uh, Pointing to the fact that she was present. I'm thinking in particular here when you say November 1944, um, and it was in the apartment of the Rosenbergs where Ruth, uh, Ruth is uh, David's uh, yes, yes, uh, wife, yes, 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 yes. Uh, was persuaded by Ethel and, uh, and Julius to uh, cooperate with the Soviet Union. So in this in this part, part for instance, it gives the idea, the impression that your idea is that Ethel is in fact. In other parts, it's not clear because uh, the main uh, accuser of Ethel has been David. Mm -hmm. yes. But then David seems to have accused her in order to cover Ruth, and yes. the passion yes. is here yes. again. Yes. So, so I, I would like to ask your opinion. I mean, it's not. Very percent. Yeah, 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 no one has read that that closely. That's very impressive. Um, right. My answer, and it'll be a quick one, strange as that might sound, is that. I am almost certain she was aware of and would have given tacit support to Julius's recruitment and activities, because he recruited quite a large people, many from City College of New York, or his, his, his pals from there. Um, 
David Greenglass, and I think I mentioned it there, admitted years later, like we might be talking about 10 years ago, that he lied, you know, committed yeah, perjury. You mentioned that. Yeah, oh right, I did, yes, I wasn't sure. Um, when he said that Ethel typed up the notes, and that was the crucial thing that got her, and that it was a fabrication. And there's big discrepancies between what he said on the witness stand in court and the original affidavits that he gave to the FBI, where Ethel wasn't mentioned at all. You know. So my answer is that she would have been aware, would have been complicit, may even have been given encouragement, none of which was an offence worthy of worthy yeah. of either a long printed prison sentence, let alone execution. Um, so yeah, there may have been some sort of tension in there. In well, the, just, just here, in, 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 that, in, 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 that, in that chapter between what I was saying at that point and what I was saying there, but you know, that's my view. I was just giving it. You were sitting in love. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes out. It's a dramatic set. Yeah. <laughs> it was weird, just on a very final note, talking with Michael Miropol, who's a very youthful 76, um, and there's all that footage of the two little boys outside Sing Sing Prison being led away by Manny Block, who's their lawyer, and they're crying and they became a bit dysfunctional. And Michael is such a well-adjusted human being now, it's weird talking to him about, well, what was your mum like? And he talked about the games that he and his dad used to play, their funny little um, 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 apartment down the Lower East Side and so on. Just to have that link with this unbelievably historic event you know, the trial and the execution of the Rosenbergs. Yeah. So, so that gave me a sort of a, a personal dimension, which I didn't have actually when I wrote that, because I only met him, you know, three months ago. Mm. So thank you very much. It has been a pleasure to have one, I mean, to discuss this book with you. I hope you will come back, Philip, soon. Thank you very much. So, it's okay then. Go off and buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> and can I have this? And I just say you've been a fantastic audience. I, you can tell, we've both been teaching long enough to know whether an audience is interested, and you have been, so thank you. Do you think I'm tomorrow for class? <laughs> <laughs> no discussion class. My good experience. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> this is the non <laughs> No, it's not the <laughs> It's the <laughs> Oh, right. I was going to say, it depends how much we drink tonight. <laughs> <laughs>